Hello, hello, and hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode. If not now, when? In today's show, I am really excited to welcome my friend Megan to join us. Megan Gallinger is two times TED speaker, a four times Amazon bestseller, TV host, and a mental health advocate. While growing up, she has a lot of challenges when it comes to anxiety and panic attacks. She grew inspiration from those rock bottoms when she was sixteen. She decided to ask for help, and that started her on the journey. She is today on the mission to change in public school systems to support young adults and give them tools so that they don't have to struggle in those mental health challenges and can live a high quality life. She is currently speaking at the colleges and Fortune five hundred companies about mental health, avoiding burnout, and the wellness in the workplace. He today is she is today is an incredible, talented speaker, author, blogger, and TV host. With that, my friends, please join me in welcoming Megan to the show. All right, well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming all the way here. I am super, super excited to have you join us today. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. When I. I can't believe the way that we met. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> um, doing ice baths, of course. Hey, it's important. We're going to talk about Rachel just in a moment. I know,、um, but I'm so excited to be here. I can't wait to share my story. Yes.、Yeah. So tell us, Megan, how does all the magic unfold for you? Oh my gosh, I would say the magic unfolds for me.、Um, I mean, my journey has been wild. Looking back.、Um, I am proud of the woman I've become. I I will say this. I've put in. A lot of work into the person I am today. You know, I do think one quote that I live by is like, "If you want something in life, you have to go get it and go after it and put in the work and the consistency." And that, for me, is you know my mental health and my happiness. I feel like that's a never-ending job.、Yeah. And、um, one thing I've just realized is, you know, my happiness is my responsibility.、Mm. No one else, you know, can、wow. make me happy. Yeah, it's a powerful thing. Like last year at 26 years old, I realized that, and I'm like, no one else. I mean, you know, maybe a boyfriend, yes, can make me happy, and they can fulfill some voids. But I'm like, only I can really make myself happy,、mm-hmm. like, and fulfill the deepest parts of my soul. And that's something that I'm pretty. How do you do that? <laughs> well,、um, <laughs> so I, my, I mean, my happiness. I am such a Kind of like a simple person at heart. I love <clears throat> sunrises, you know, morning coffee,、yes. making my bed every morning. I love the routine.、Um, I like eating healthy, exercising.、Um, I like just being in nature. Like all those things bring me so much joy, and also helping other people. Like that's,、mm. you know, I've been doing this for. I mean. Close to ten years. I started, which is crazy. Speaking at eighteen years old, and now I'm I'm turning twenty eight in a few months. So almost ten years. And I would say the last ten years have really taught me so much about you know the po- the ripple effect of positivity, right? Like people always remember how you make them feel, and people always remember you know she made me feel heard and understood and seen, and you know I just I will that's something I've always dreamt of is even when I was like thirteen years old, really little. I remember thinking I was like I never want to work for someone else. I just knew、you、even already knew I knew that in like seventh. I mean, yeah, like seventh grade, eighth grade. I remember sitting in my math class one day, and I was always you know a big dreamer, like creative, like head in the clouds. And I would just be trying to focus, force myself to focus on r- ratios and decimals. And I'm just like I I can never see myself, you know.、Um, Living like I can never see myself working for someone else and building someone else's dream.、Mm. I just knew that I was like my life is meant to be on my own terms,、mm. and I knew that from a really young age. And I so, just yeah. How was that manifesting at that moment? You had that thought. <laughs> I know. Years old, I know. Thirteen to... years old in my s- seventh grade math class, and my、exactly. teacher's like focus, and I'm like, <laughs> like staring out the window.、Um, I feel like it just. So tell us how everything began for you. Oh my god! What、gosh. is that sixteen? I know. Where do we go back?、Um, so everything began truly. I would say way back, even in fourth grade. I mean, as young as, I mean, how old? Nine years old. So if we go back, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area.、Um, I grew up in a tiny suburb called Lafayette, outside of San Francisco. 
It's super tiny, very pretty, very like quaint, a great hometown. Um, and I grew up in a really normal household, like super positive. I had a lovely childhood, but um, I always was, when I was younger, I was always just the nervous, shy kid, even though it wouldn't make sense now because I'm so social. No way. I know, but as a, <laughs> no, seriously, as a kid, I was so shy. I was so like, just wanted to be with my mom. I was always so anxious. I worried a lot. Mm. And, you know, in fourth grade, the field trip sleepovers, like the fourth grade camp, I would like dread going. I was like, no, I can't go. I would just cry. And my mom's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I just don't feel good. And she's like, what's wrong? So I was having anxiety at that age, but I didn't really know it. Because when you're that young, you know, you don't have the emotional like yeah. capacity to understand, okay, this is a panic attack or, you know, I'm just feeling anxious. I just would cry. And I would, my mom's like, um, are you okay? So you know, time goes by. I hit middle school and it just it started getting, you know, it's just slowly as I developed, went through puberty and everything. Middle school, I would say was kind of dormant. But then high school, my freshman year of high school is when it just got terrible, like my anxiety because, you know, the change from middle school um, the transition to high school, a brand new school, half of my friends going to a different high school, just the change, you know, a lot of change at once. It just triggered my anxiety. And I was just having like, I remember the summer before my freshman year of high school, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, something's just wrong. I was like, I feel like I'm dying, like dreading the day that high school starts. And I remember you know, just the overwhelm, trying to find your locker, you know, the, oh my gosh, seven classes and homework and who's going to homecoming dance and boys. And it's just so much like stimulus at once. And I'm like, this is just a lot. So I remember my first panic attack ever. Um, I was sitting in my freshman English class in high school and I was sitting there trying to focus on what the teacher is saying. And I noticed like my heart rate starts getting, you know, really, really fast. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't breathe. And my hands get super sweaty. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm dying. And the whole room just is like, you know, tunnel vision and everything. And I'm like, I literally am just gonna like, like what's happening? Cause when you are having anxiety or panic attacks, and when you don't know what's going on, you just feel like you are dying and it's really scary. And so I thought I was having like a heart attack or a stroke. And I just like, I felt like my throat was closing up and I'm like, I can't breathe. And so I asked my teacher, I'm like, can I go to the bathroom? And I grab the hall pass and I just like bolt to the bathroom. And then I sit in the bathroom stalls and it's like, I just like these cold, like quiet bathroom stalls. And I'm like trying to catch my breath. And it was like, it was just awful. And that was my first panic attack at like 15 years old. And then from that point on, I started just having like literally 15 panic attacks a day. Like it was just an, a really – it was a hard time in my life. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I was like getting C minuses and Ds in school. I was in, you know, a toxic relationship and I was like hanging on by a thread. And for me, you know, I just was – in survival mode all the time. I was like, just make it five more minutes. You know what I mean? Like I was barely functioning yet. I still on the outside, you know, was like the class clown, super, you know, goofy, smiley, like no one would think it. And so that's why I am such a big mental health advocate because, you know, you can't judge someone by what, like what they look like, because, mm -hmm. you know, you never know who's struggling. Like it could be Mm -hmm. I mean, the person that's making six figures that drives a Range Rover and they could have horrible depression. You know what I mean? Like you just don't know what other people go through. And so um, I feel like for me, you know, my rock bottom, kind of the moment that, I mean, my first panic attack changed my life, but the moment that really changed my life and changed the trajectory of my path was, um, so a year had gone by and I was having panic attacks every day and just really going into a low point. So I hit sophomore year the next year. And I remember one day I was just like, can I, my same thing, can I go to the bathroom? That's what I did every day just to escape and to have my panic attack in private. So I go sit in the bathroom stall and I just remember, you know, looking like at the graffiti on the bathroom stall walls, people would write and just hearing like the generator humming in the bathroom. And it was really quiet and the white tiles on the ground. And I just remember thinking, you know, at like 15 and a half, 16 years old, I was like, I, I was like, you know what? I don't see a future for myself. Like, it's a weird thing because at that point, you know, people are getting ready for the SAT, for college, like preparing themselves and thinking about where they're going to like go and graduate. And I was like, you know, 
I don't even see a future for myself. So I, like, I'm just not there mentally. I was like, I'm just trying to make it five more minutes. I, I don't see a two years from now. And so that was like my rock bottom moment where I thought to myself, um, I, I was like, you know what? I, I want to feel better. And I had that like kind of lightning bolt moment, I call it, where it's an epiphany. And I felt like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm ready to feel better. I don't I don't want to feel this way again. And I'm sick of just hanging on by a thread and like barely getting by. So that night, it changed my entire life. I basically, um, you know, went back in my classroom. And I just that night when I got home from school, I, you know, whatever, hung out, had dinner with my parents. And then once they were cleaning and doing dishes, I sat them down and I said, you know, I told them everything that had been going on and how I'd been struggling. And they really had no idea. And it it was a big moment that changed my entire life. And I realized there is a beauty in asking for help. And it, it I was so, I literally, my hands were like this and I'm like, mom and dad, <laughs> like I was so afraid, but I had to ask for help. And um, I will never forget that moment. I had to be brave. And they immediately were like, <clears throat> You know, in my head, I'm thinking, you know, they're going to ship me off to like a boarding school or something awful is going to happen. But I was like, you know what? I just I have to do this for myself. I don't care how uncomfortable I feel right now. I was like, I need to do this and just I have to do this. So um, and they were so kind. You know, they were they were like holding the space for me. They did not once interrupt me or judge me. And I was like, holy I was like, huh. I thought they were, you know, I thought the worst. And I was so shocked because I knew that they loved me, but I never knew that they loved me this much. And to me that as a child, having your parents just hold the space for you and not judge you and not like, it was just really powerful. So they were like, okay, next, you know, therapy in four days, let's go. And so I had my first therapy appointment four days later. And so, cause my parents were like, you know, this is happening right now. Um, we're going to take action right now. You know, this is something that you don't just push it under the rug, like mental health. I'm glad that I have parents that took it really seriously. And they were like, you know, while you're 16, your brain's still developing. We want you to get help right now. So then when you're an adult, you have all the tips and the tools and you know, you know, you like, you know yourself. So I started therapy at, at 15 and a half and that just changed my entire life. And so I still, even though it's been it literally, tw I think, how many years? 12, 13 years since that age. I still have a therapist to this day. <laughs> I um, I still like I still do all the wellness hacks. Thankfully, I don't get anxiety anymore just because I've done so much work in the therapy and the EMDR and the meditations and the, you know, I've done breath work. I've done it all. So I'm in a really good mental space. But it just, you know, if like looking back for me at 27, looking back, if that challenging time did not happen, I would not be the woman I am today. And I I really now I'm a believer. I'm really spiritual. And I'm like, you know, everything does happen for a reason. Even the hard times, even the, you know, why me, poor me, like I don't deserve this. It's all happening for a bigger purpose. It's really like it is. And when you kind of trust that or when you can look back and be like, wow, that was, mm. you know, it happened for me, right? Mm -hmm. Not to me. There's a difference. It happened for me, not to me. And that's one of my books I wrote. I've written four books and my, my third book is called It's Happening For Me, Not To Me. Oh, wow. Because that's one of my favorite quotes where I talk about the energetic difference of like looking back at your life challenges instead of saying like, oh, you know, poor me and all that stuff. Empower yourself, you know, lift yourself up and be like, actually, that happened for me because it taught me X, Y, Z or it led me to here and I wouldn't have met that the love of my life or whatever. I feel like everything in life is connected. So that's <laughs> in a nutshell. I mean, that's kind of how I got to where I am, though, is, you know, school was amazing. I loved high school, but I was never into academics. I, I knew my passion. The universe really put me in that situation so I could learn to love self-care and wellness stuff. And so I I mean, I never went to college like after high school. I um, <clears throat> I moved down to L.A. and I just started motivational speaking. I just started my career. I my, told my parents, I was like, I don't want to go to college. I know my passion. And they were like, <laughs> they're very supportive. They're like, great. Life is really short. Do what makes you happy. Wow. Yeah. So I just literally, <laughs> I started at 18. I like, I, you know, I knew nobody. And I just like, I made business cards online and I was just, I had no money. <laughs> so I'm just like going around to schools like, hey, my name's Megan. I want to speak at your school. And I can't tell you how many times I got rejected or people were like, what organization are you part of? And I'm like, no, it's just me. And they're like, 
uh, do you have a degree? And I'm like, no. And they're like, uh, like the, it, so it was just wild because at that age, you know, getting told no and having to still get, get up every day and walk around to like, I'm not kidding, like 30 schools in a day and just doing that over and over and over again because I had no connections. You know, it was just like me and I didn't come from a super fancy family. So just doing that, though, it really taught me the power of resiliency and the power like it built my character. You know what I mean? Having to get up and like present myself. And it was like the best lessons ever of just learning how to work a room, even when I was being told no, I, I still showed up and I still was like, you know what? At that age, I'm like, I'm actually going to use this as a practice to just continue to get better on my pitch, even though these people, (laughs) you know, they think I'm crazy and they're staring at me like you're 18 and you have no degree. And like, why are you coming to our school? I just I still took it really seriously. And I really tried hard to do the better, better, better. And then, I mean, boom, you know, it snowballed into like something bigger. But I will never forget those years of like really hustling (laughs) and just trying to make it happen. And I, you know. I don't know. It was just like it was the best time. And I I really do feel like those years shaped me into who I am. What was the turning point? The turning point was when I turned, uh, I would say when I, so the whole timeline, because <laughs> it's a timeline. So at 18, you know, I was in LA. The turning point was when I was 20, 21. Um, I gave my first TEDx talk. So three years later, gave my first TEDx talk. And that is a whole other story in itself. But um, I basically, you know, applied to speak at a TEDx conference for two years. And I was, I just got a bunch of no's for two years straight, but I kept on emailing every day for two years. I would send six emails every single day just to hold myself accountable. And then I, um, I just finally landed one and it was so meant to be like some speaker had, um, you know, had gotten sick and couldn't speak. So I took her spot. And it's funny because I, you know, I really stand by this. Um, You know, even though for two years straight, I was rejected and told no and, you know, no, no, I still practiced. I still was always ready. I was Hmm. speaking at YMCA's Boys and Girls Clubs because I'm like, I'm going to show the universe that I am ready and I'm going to really tailor my speaking abilities and just become the best. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the universe was paying attention and was like, hey, this girl actually like is putting out that energy and it's already happening and all those things. So I I just never, you know, I never gave up. And then when it happened, it's funny, when the TEDx conference, they were like, okay, so typically our speakers get, you know, months to prepare. They were like, okay, so our speaker is sick. You're taking her spot. You only have two weeks. Are you ready? And I'm like, yeah, I am. Because actually I've always been, I've been preparing for two years. So it's a cool story because it shows you, you know, never give up and also always be ready, right? Always be ready for your dream job in shape, camera ready, hair, makeup, whatever that means for you, but always be ready because you don't know, you know, what's around the corner. But so that TEDx talk was one of the best talks, um, I ever gave and my parents were there. It was very special and I nailed it. I was so nervous before I was like this, but I really worked hard to, it was just an amazing experience. Um, And I'd say that like after that, my career kept on going up and up and up. And then when I was 24, um, I got signed to my first speaking bureau, which is like a talent agency, like for models and actors, but it's called bureau. Um, And it's for speakers. And I got signed to my first bureau when I was 24. Um, And it was through a really good friend of mine, Shelly Zalas, who is a really powerful woman in the speaking world. She is the CEO of the Female Quotient. And she's just an incredible human. She's done so much work for ending the gender pay gap with women and men. And she's been a trailblazer for women in the workplace. Um, So she got me signed to my first bureau at 24, the Washington Speakers Bureau. It's very prestigious, and I feel so grateful for that connection. Um, And then after that, I got signed to um, Gotham Artists in New York City. I got signed to um, All American Entertainment, and then I got signed to um, Big Speak, which is – they're all bureaus. So that was really powerful. Um, And then, yeah, I feel like – There's just, I mean, there's so many stories in my career that I could share, and I love talking about all those things, but it's been a wild ride. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a story. What a journey, Megan, because Mm -hmm. I think people might start looking at you, wow, she's young, she's so accomplished. You might wonder, you know, what is the story behind it? But actually, listen to the the journey (laughs) and see how hard you hustle, how hard you work. That's the one thing I will say is 
you know, I don't think social media ever really shows. It's like the tip of an iceberg, mm -hmm. right? You see the 10% on the top. You mm -hmm. don't see the 90% underneath. You don't really see how much people really hustle and how long it takes and how much work goes into achieving their dreams. I mean, totally. everyone's journey is different. You know, some people are an overnight boom celebrity. Some people it's 10 years, 20 years, whatever. But I mean, regardless, you still have to work your butt off. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the consistency and showing up again and again and again. And, you know, I just feel like I owe a lot of who I am to, you know, so many people, but definitely um, my family. I feel like my parents really instilled in me and my sister, I mean, my sister too, but my parents really instilled in me just never give up. Anything is possible. You have the same 24 hours in the day as anyone else. Like they were like, you can do anything. And I feel like as a child, when you're told that, you know, over and over and over again, you start to believe it, right? You're like, oh my God, anything is possible. Like I, I've got this, I can do it. So it's very contagious. Um, and my mom always told me, she said, she said, Megan, you know, if someone tells you no, it means you're talking to the wrong person. Oh. And she always told me that, you know, she's like, if some, doesn't matter, modeling agency or person or PR, if someone just says, no, you know, you're not a good fit, don't take it personally. You know, just, I mean, you know, well, it's was like- it hard though? Oh, it's so hard being told no. I yeah, it's so not it's, take it personal. No, it's hard. It's like, you feel so, you're like, ooh, especially I think in the modeling world too, like I've- it's one of my dreams to get signed to an agency. And I, I, I mean, like I, you know, I think I'm a beautiful person, but in the modeling industry, it's very hard. <laughs> you have to fit certain requirements that are super specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, if you're not this height and your bust and your waist and your hips, and I mean, I'm not shaming anyone, but it's definitely like, you know, I'm five foot seven. I am average height. I, no, you are um, above average. You're beautifully tall. I know. Thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. But it's just in the modeling world, you know, it can feel very uh, disheartening because you're like, oh, so I'm being rejected. So it means I'm not good enough. But I realized, you know, there are so many brands like Sports Illustrated magazine that I love um, because they, you know, they really represent like that's why I go to all their events and I've been going for three years and it's a dream of mine to be in Sports Illustrated. <laughs> Shout out uh, their magazine because they represent women. First of all, they never Photoshop their photos, which I love. I've met the editor in chief, MJ Day. She's an angel of a human. She's lovely. I've met all the models, you know, Camille Kostek, Katie Austin, uh, Brooks Nader, um, Jasmine Sanders, um, just I'm, I've met so many of them. Uh, Christy Valdeseri. I've met um, the newest, the rookies. They're, they're all phenomenal people and they all are so genuine and they're exactly what you think they would be in person. And I just feel like Sports Illustrated, it's so beautiful because they represent, yeah, women of all shapes, sizes, colors, races, ethnicities, and they never want you to change for the photo shoot. Like they, you know, it's all about honoring you and what you bring to the magazine and I really do think that like one day when I'm in it uh I would add so much value to it because I want to be a face for women who have overcome mental health struggles and to let them know that they can live out their dreams you know despite any obstacle of anxiety or depression it's like you still are worthy and you know, I just, I love all, I love the magazine. So, but as I was saying, I do feel like the modeling industry, it is changing because there are brands like Sports Illustrated that are really paving the way for including every body type. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, that's, t that's a dream one day. And I, knowing me, I probably won't stop until I achieve it, but there we um, go. I know. So, but yeah, I feel like in my own life journey, I've when I was younger in high school, I also struggled a lot with body image issues because I always felt like, and that's another one, my book, my first book, Why Don't I Look Like Her? That's the title is because when I was in high school, that's something I would say to myself over and over again. I would say, uh, you know, why don't I look like her? Just in the school hallways, walking around my high school subconsciously, I never saw any other girl in my school that looked like me. I, you know, they were all... And once again, this is not judging, but I just was so insecure. I was like, you know, they're all tall and tan and blonde. And I was like, sh you know, shorter and different body type. And like, well, five, seven, you are short. I mean, the girl, yeah, some girls in my high school were tall, like five, nine, five, ten, five, eleven. And so I would just constantly be thinking, you know, like, oh my gosh, I just, why don't I look like her? And so that's why I titled 
my first book that because yeah. I, that's a, such a real thing that most teenage girls go through. We all mm. go through the, mm. you know, growing into your body and feeling awkward and it's just, it's a real thing. And so I wrote that because I wanted other girls to know that they're not alone mm. and it's very common and it's just, it's a process. Self-love and loving your body is such a lifelong journey. 100%. You know, it's this, va it's like this decision we make and it's like throughout my whole entire life, I will choose myself again and again and I'll choose to love myself and um you know it's like I I don't th I feel like with body image you know it's it we're never going to like arrive you know what I mean it's not going to be like oh today at you know 30 years old I fully love myself and I'm just I'm done putting in the work and I I, I love myself it's like <gasps> that's not true because life is just we're always evolving right we're always going to be growing and that's the beauty of life but it's like we also you know like how I love myself at 25 is so different than how I'm going to love myself, you know, when I'm like a mom or when I'm 50, right? Because our body is going to change and our life is going to change and we're going to evolve as a person. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to be thinking differently and have different beliefs and stuff. So I feel like that's, yeah, what I like about life is like, we're never done growing. Until the last breath on earth, we're yeah. never done. Seriously, I was talking to my grandma the other day and <laughs> she's 89 and she's like, oh, yeah, the other day I learned a new lesson. And I'm like, what's that? And she's like, yeah, I was having a conversation with my friend, blah, blah, blah. And we got into like an argument. And I'm like, wow, even at 89, <laughs> you're never done, you know, kind of learning. So <laughs> Your last it's, breath. yeah, yeah, no, seriously. So Megan, you speak about getting so much rejections early on in different arenas. I'm curious, how do you see hold on to you know, that self-worth part you talked about earlier. How do you yeah. not gather into your insecurity feeling, oh my God, am I cut off for this particular path I'm going after? Yeah. How do you balance in that? Because the reason I asked for it, because today so many entrepreneurs, so many business men and women, they are they are hustling, not struggling to to raising capital, to get yes for investors, to getting yeah. the first sales, to do all the things. And there's so many no's. Just when you think it's over, they are coming, right? It's hard. How do you... How do you really in that process, you know, still knowing who you are, still knowing why yeah. you do what you do and still have that courage to keep yeah. going? I would say, and that, I mean, that's a good word because it does take courage. And on, being an entrepreneur is not an easy task. It's juggling like 12 balls at once and the balls are on fire and you're like on, you know, a pogo stick and you're like, hi. Um, I would say... I, I like it's just it's built within me I mean yeah it's just built within me like I the, the person the woman I am today is I I'm a mentally tough person because of everything I've been through and that's why I feel like everything is so connected in life I would not be the resilient person I am if I had not gone through xyz mm -hmm. and I owe so much of per, the person I am to my parents you know they I had a very normal childhood I you know grew up like going in my, you know, court every day after school and playing basketball with the boys in my neighborhood and just playing in the creek and like super normal, like no technology or anything. And I feel like my upbringing and just really, really cool parents that told me, you know, you are beautiful. You you deserve it. You are worthy. Having parents that tell you that it really just shapes you. So how can we do in addition to that incredible blessing from yes. our parents? I know. And so I feel like it's a mixture of my parents, my upbringing, me as a person, like who I am morally, I, you know, I believe in let's go, you know, I can do this. I've got this. I say that to myself probably like 30 times a day. I'm like, I've got this. I can do this. Yeah. Everything. I have so many affirmations because just being an entrepreneur every day is such a roller coaster. You know, this deal works out and then this doesn't and then blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, I can't do this. Like everything is, <laughs> everything is working out for me. Like I have so many things that I say, um, <clears throat> but I feel like the confidence, you know, that just comes from, I just feel like this may sound, I don't know. I feel like for me, the confidence comes from um, being like really the rejection being told no so many times and, you know, you're not good enough or you don't have enough followers, you don't have enough engagement or, you know, you're not a New York Times bestselling author. Like I've been told no I mean, probably like thousands of times, you know, you're just, you don't have what it takes. You, you don't have, you know, the money. You're just not this. You're not that. You're too short. You're acne scars. You're this, you're that. You're, and being told that so many times over and over and over again, it, it will make or break you, you know, like it's really 
all this this industry it's like it's not for the weak it takes a lot of balls like cojones to do this and so I feel like when it makes or breaks you it's like I just decided to keep on going because I knew my why right like why my why is I never want any teenager to feel how I felt Mm. and that's why I do what I do is because I have Mm. a really personal story I know what it feels like to be in a really low point and be hanging on by a thread Mm -hmm. and I just I decided for me in that bathroom stall I never wanted to feel this way again Mm. but I now for me my why is I never want any teenager in America to feel that way. Mm. I want to so be powerful. I want to be the change maker. I want to give a voice to the voiceless, you know? Mm. I really do stand by that. And one thing I've, you know, heard from I have so many idols that I look up to, but one of my favorites is uh Jamie Kern Lima, who is the founder of It Cosmetics, who has a an incredible story about rejection and just her story of, you know, QVC and just everything. And then she made it. And now she's one of, she's iconic. Um, And I feel like for me, you know, all of that rejection, it shaped her into the person she is today. And it's like, even when you're told no, it hurts a lot. But little do you know, it's like it's teaching you the resiliency to get back up one more time, to have thicker skin and it's really preparing you for something bigger. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I feel like also, you know, in the beginning stages of my career, um, another story, I had so many, uh, you know, I was hustling my butt off just to like make motivational speaking work when I was like 19, 20. I was, you know, I was a waitress. I was working front desk at gyms and I had to wake up at three in the morning just to open up the gym. I have been, I've cleaned sweaty yoga studios, you know, I've like I've cleaned toilet. I've done every job truly just to make it happen. Um and those jobs taught me the discipline truly of like continue, you know, the resiliency. You, you just show up, you work hard. It taught me that um building that character. And I feel like one of my favorite jobs that I've had is uh working at this gym, the front desk, I had to be up at 3 a.m. to open up the gym at 5 a.m. every morning. Um, And, you know, I had to stand, literally, looking back, it was a little intense. I had to stand for 12 hours. There were no chairs, so I had to stand for 12 hours. And, you know, I'm the front desk of a gym, so you're working with people checking in and the phone call. So it's so much at once. And then people are, gym members are, you know, throwing towels at you, screaming and saying, this is not done. You learn. You have to learn how to handle all those things at once. You have to learn how to stay cool under pressure. And it, to me, I compare it to, you know, in the movie, The Karate Kid from the 80s, you know, Mr. Miyagi is like, okay, so clean these cars, right? Wax on, wax off. And he's like, yeah, but what is this teaching me? Like, I, I don't see this. And he's like, just continue doing it. Little does he know this is all preparing him to win the championships. And then he's a legend forever. That's something that I wish in those moments I knew, you know what I mean? In those jobs where I'm like, what is this teaching? Right? Because we all get frustrated when things don't go our way. It's a horrible feeling being rejected and being told you're not enough. Mm. I'm like, question. I go back, you know, I literally, I'm like questioning everything. I'm like, why do I believe in the universe? You know, who, okay, it didn't work out. So then I guess these dreams are not meant for me, right? I start questioning myself as a woman and my upbringing, but I realize, you know, I allow myself to feel the feelings, but then I always go back to staying in my lane of, I believe in the faith and I'm choosing to believe again. I'm choosing to try one more time. Mm. And the getting up and choosing again that instilled in me to keep on going no matter what. Um, so and so it's ingrained in me. It's in my DNA to just keep on going, to focus on solutions. Um, but all those jobs though, right? Cleaning toilets and sweaty yoga studios, having to mop st- like everything and do laundry in the back of a student and having to fold towels for five hours. Like it really taught me just there is a beauty in the process. And even though I may start this job, you know, feeling frustrated, but by the time I'm done folding all these towels, guess what? I've, I've come up with solutions for all my problems. It's so therapeutic. Right. And I'm like always the type of person where I'm always like, how can I use this time to really, you know, benefit me? I don't care what situation I, this is everyone listen to this. To me, this is what makes people successful. The most successful people that I look up to, you know, regardless of money, whatever, what makes them successful is the fact that 
whatever situation they are in, maybe they are in a job where they're, yeah, cleaning toilets, whatever, folding stuff, they always use that time. How can I become better? How can I really take advantage of this time and squeeze all the lemon, like squeeze the lemons out of this? To me, that is what successful people do. They make the best out of situations. They they put on their leader cap mm-hmm. and they're like, I can do this. And they rise up, mm-hmm. right? They just do it. Even when no one is watching, they, they do the right thing. They still show up to that job, even if they don't want to. And mm-hmm. they still make their bed. They still do it, right? And so I feel like that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's one thing I really pride myself on is like, I have so many goals and dreams and I'm only 27 and I still get rejected to this day, but I still, you know, I won't give up until I get there. So tell us about your dream. Okay. So my dreams, (laughs) I would say my dreams are to be New York Times bestselling author. I would say my, uh, I have so many dreams. My second dream is um, to be an E! News red carpet correspondent, like E! News. I love E! News. I love the fashion. I love pop culture. I love talking. Um, E! News is a dream. My third dream is to be in Sports Illustrated magazine. I love what they represent, what they, you know, they really allow women of all walks of life to show their story and to help other people. And that's what I'm all about. Um, I'd say my fourth dream is to give 15 TEDx talks. So far, I'm at two, but I want to give 15. Uh, my last- That's a number matters. I think it'd just be cool to accomplish 15, but I want to give a lot. Um, And I would say my fourth dream is to start a foundation where I really help kids and teenagers in low-income neighborhoods who don't have access to mental health treatments, you know, therapy and breath work and um, EFT tapping. I want to give that to kids and teenagers that don't have the money to do that. That's something that's really important to me is – you know, sometime in my lifetime, I want to create like, you know, Megan's Foundation or something cool where I can give back to kids all across America. What are you waiting for? Let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right amazing. Now. I know. So I have if not now when I know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And so I would say my last dream on top of that is really um, I feel like what happened to me in my high school happened on purpose. And it's one of my biggest dreams to really change the public school system Mm. across America Mm. and have mandatory. This is something that I want to like looking back when I'm 90 years old, I want to look back and say, I never gave up. And I, I permanently changed the public school system in the United States. I want to have mandatory classes in every single high school about mental health and meditation and journaling and breath work. That is something that I, you know, I just won't quit until I see it come to fruition. I want to be the one that does that in my lifetime because I know what it feels like, once again, to be that kid in high school that is barely getting by, that on the outside, you know, you look fine and you're pretty and people are like, oh, but you're always happy. Oh, you have your life together. You always look great. And I'm like, yeah, but on the inside, I feel like I'm done. I know what that feels like to be Mm -hmm. that person. And so, I, I have so much fire under my butt because obvious. Yeah, because I know I really know what that feels like from firsthand experience. But yeah. So I'm a passionate person. <laughs> it's to say the least. Yeah. Passionate fireballs having such a big I'm a Scorpio to too. So that's why You are? I'm November tenth. That's my birthday. November sixth. Are you serious? I'm serious. Two Scorpios. Oh yes. my goodness. Scorpios are powerful people. That's why. They're all leaders. Called. They're always like Just leaders who are very trailblazer, who get stuff done. I love a Scorpio. (laughs) (laughs) I knew we got along. (laughs) Wow. So much, so much love on the day. So thank you for that, Megan. Yes, of course. I'm curious, what do you think is your superpower? I know we cover a lot of them, but if you're looking back in your journey, in your success, because you you, you said it perfectly that that day when you sat in that stall, you were not the only one right there, but you were the one that came this far and able to turn those challenging moments into such a beautiful blessing. And now you empower, enlightening so many incredible students Mm -hmm. and leaders of the world to do exactly what you do. What do you think is your superpower if you can some in one sentences or one phrase? I would say my superpower is my energy. Mm. I, I really, I feel one of my favorite quotes ever is, um, it's from Jim Carrey, who's one of my favorite actors ever. Um, he's phenomenal. And one of his, something he said that I will never forget is, 
you know, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency that there is. You know, people won't remember what kind of car you drive. People won't remember, you know, what clothing you wore. People, people, people won't even remember, you know, what you say, but people always remember how you made them feel. Mm. And the the effect you have on other people is the most important thing, mm. the most valuable currency. So that's one of my favorite quotes. And I, you know, I just feel like my energy is my superpower. I've always known from a young age, and my mom especially has always told me, like, Megan, every room that you walk into, you light it up and you make people feel so warm and so special. And so I always feel like that's, a gift that I have. I have the ability and it goes hand in hand with public speaking, right? Like I have the ability to make other people feel really good and to make people feel happy. And so I never forget that, you know, like no matter how many accolades I achieve or wherever I go in my life, like I'll never forget, um, you know, just to like smile and to make people like I have the ability to make people happy and to make people feel less alone and to make people feel heard and seen and understood. And that's something I take a lot of pride in. I love that. Yeah. I think it's a <laughs> it's a big world, but sometimes it could be a little bit lonely world when we stuck in oh, your completely. own. Completely. Being an adult is hard. <laughs> oh, 100%. I, yeah. Speaking about challenges, I know you are such a big advocate for, you know, mental health specifically. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, it's so applied because I don't even heard of hustle culture where yeah. everyone's all about working hard, don't give up, keep going, uh, right? But yeah. in the meantime, also other side of that coin as well is how do we recognize in burnout? How do we yeah. notice those symptoms? It's, like you said, yeah. maybe you don't even know you're experiencing yeah. those. How do you, you know, recognize so for those moments? I think, honestly, you know, burnout is like, it's a it's a real thing. You know, first of all, being an entrepreneur, um, it's it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and you're pouring so much of your soul into it. So I feel like for me, when I started this journey 10 years ago, something I really, 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 um, you know, prided myself on, I was like, you know what? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And that's something I believe in is if I want to have a long-term career, I always just stand firmly. This is my belief. I will always put my wellness first before anything. Let's talk about that. What does that look like? If someone I right always, now I always, I always get a lot of sleep. I always take time off with to be with my family, to rest. I do ice baths, sauna, IV drips, breath work. I eat very healthy. I don't do dairy, gluten, soy, or pork. I really don't drink alcohol at all. Um... I, I like I just mind, body, soul. I want to feel my best so that I can g- do my best on stage and really be authentic and perform. So I feel like burnout, you know, it's a real thing. And I do feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, there is the hustle culture, right? Of like, you know, bur- like work till you die. Just like work, work, work. And if you're not working fucking, <laughs> you know, 22 hours a day, then you're a loser. That's just not true. Because yeah. so I mean, what is truth? I think life is about balance mm-hmm. uh, because to me what does balance look like everything goes hand in hand right in life like if you're overworking then that means you're burnt out and then that means you're tired and then you know every you can't be like a good you know mother father sister brother you can't take care of yourself so everything in life is connected it starts at you you know you're the core you're the umbrella everything else umbrellas out right so it's like I feel like you have to fill up your cup. You have to make sure that you are good and well and happy so then you can be a good coworker, CEO, and you can still, you know, have time because so many things in life fulfill us, right? Family time, um, alone time, you know, uh, ice, like self-care, r- romantic relationships. We have many things that fulfill us in life. And if you're not doing one or too much of one, you will feel out of balance and you'll mm-hmm. feel that energetically. And you'll just be like, why do I feel so unfulfilled? Well, when is the last time, you know, you've been on a date or like, do you check in with yourself? Are you doing self-inquiry? Like when is the last time I did an ice bath or did something that makes me happy? When's the last time I hung out with my family? You know, it's important. I do that every day. Like I'm always checking in with myself. That's beautiful. And saying, okay, who am I hanging out with? Cause energy is real. And you know, <laughs> seriously, if I'm hanging around people that are like low vibrational and you know, I mean, not judging, but like go out and drink all the time and don't really have big goals and dreams. I'm hanging around those people. Um, 
well, then that's probably why, you know, I feel so unmotivated. It's real. You know, who you surround yourself with and where you're going and the TV shows you're watching and everything you're absorbing Mm -hmm. is like it affects you on an energetic level. And I mean, for me, for example, like I've loved being in Austin, Texas. It's been amazing. But I've realized, you know, I know where I'm happiest and that's in Miami Beach, Florida. I, I lived there before I moved here. And I kind of moved here, you know, YOLO, why not? I want to try a new city. I'm young. I run my own business. I can work from wherever. And I, I like picking up and trying new things for the experience and to grow. And I, I do love that. But Miami is just what makes me happy. And I've realized, you know, I really like growing. And that's like my love language is pushing myself. I have to feel like I'm pushing myself every day. I love that. To be happy. I can't be stagnant. I will literally kicking and I will just... I can't be stagnant. My biggest fear in life is settling and just not achieving what I want to achieve. So I feel like for me, I, I really, really, really like, it's already in the works, but I'm definitely moving back to Miami within the next few months because I just miss it too much. My soul, like literally, (laughs) I'm so happy there. (laughs) So it's important though, to always check in with yourself. If you feel intuitively, energetically, you know, like, why am I unhappy? You know, check in with yourself. Like, I feel unfulfilled. Okay, but why? You know what I mean? I call it funnel thinking where Mm. if you think about it this way, you know, you start at the beginning, the general, right? Because a funnel is big at the top, small at the bottom. So the top, the general is like, okay, labeling an emotion. I feel what? Tired, unfulfilled, lethargic, jealous, angry, cool. But every time you question it, right? Like, but why? But why? But why? But why? You'll get to the root the real reason why you feel that emotion. That's what I do all the time. I learned it in therapy. It's called funnel thinking. Um, So if I feel unhappy, well, why do I feel unhappy? Well, what did I do in the last 24 hours? Uh, You know, I went to bed late or I didn't have time to do my laundry. I didn't get to work out. Okay, you know, it's like that makes sense. I didn't get time to exercise. That always makes me feel good. Or I just didn't get time to clean my apartment and I always love doing laundry. So it's like when you then ask yourself why, why, why? It's the most helpful tool because you'll always have the answers for your happiness and your emotions. You know what I mean? It's really that simple. We, because so many things, hundreds of things create our happiness every day. And if, you know, if you're not paying attention to like, oh, well, because I I ate McDonald's. Well, it's like, of course, McDonald's is going to make you feel gross. You know what I mean? Because it is gross food. So it's like really acknowledging all these things go into who we are as a person and our well-being. It's a big deal. So For me, it's like living in Austin, you know, the past few months, I've loved it, but I just kept on feeling like something is just missing. Mm -hmm. uh, There's just something I feel unfulfilled. Well, boom, I'm like, wait, it's because I want to be back in Miami. And that really fulfills my soul. So I think it's also... What stop you? That's an easy fix. I know. I'm. Just, it's already in the works. I'm already, I already have movers and everything, so I'm excited. Um, when are you leaving? Hopefully, it's October 10th. Oh, that's very the, specific. I know. Oh, wow. That's the date. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited. Very exciting. I know. So, um, but you know, this type of thinking though, it's like, it's really, really powerful because basically, you know, it's like, number one, don't be afraid to go deep with yourself. You know, don't be afraid to really look within. But number two, you know, don't be afraid to take action. So how do you go like, over? How do you overcome the fear when you look inwards? Now maybe something even bigger yeah, surprise yeah, you. Yeah. That show up. How do you still have that faith, having that courage to say, you know what? What is behind this? I'm gonna move forward with that, no matter what. Yeah. So I would say to like just, I mean, to get comfortable with the fear, right? Because we'll always have things that pop up, childhood stuff, you know, inner wounds, um, unhealed stuff from past relationships. But just to know that you know, you're in charge and these emotions and things that pop up, they're not like, you know, monsters. They're just emotions. Mm. So to kind of like take power and be like, you know what? Like I, I always say this, you know, I am safe to sit in this emotion. And for me, Oh, I like that. I, yeah. I am safe to sit in this emotion. Even if it's a very great, like painful emotions are grief, frustration, anger, jealousy, hatred, whatever. Those can be hard for people to really, you know, sit in. So you just say out loud while by yourself? Yeah. If I feel a negative emotion, I just say to myself, you know, I am safe to sit in this feeling. Do you just do that? Yeah. And then what happens? And then I just, I feel more, 
like aware, you know, I feel more aware that this emotions come and go. First of all, nothing lasts forever, the good, the hard. So knowing that I'm like, okay, so this frustration, you know, I don't have to go drink alcohol to numb it or, you know, go watch 10 hours of Netflix. Like I'm not judging, but everyone has their, you know, coping mechanism. What's your coping mechanism when those moments happen? When those moments happen, um, I mean, I'm not a perfect person, but I would say I do breath work that helps me kind of breathe through stuff. I love breath work or I'll sit in it and meditate on it and allow myself to feel my feelings. Right. Like, you know, this past year I had some family friends that passed away and that was super, super, it still is hard. Um, You know, one of them was super young and it was really unexpected. It was a tragedy. Um, And that was you know, just like I said, it caught me so off guard um, and it was awful and I just didn't expect it. And, you know, the grief, grief is a really, it's a hard emotion to sit in. It's a roller coaster. It comes and it goes and it can be so intense. It can like feel like it's swallowing you whole. But, you know, knowing that these moments that are filled with grief, like just to allow myself to feel it fully, you know, I'll, I'll, I cry. I feel my feelings. I'll journal. I'll write notes to, I'll just write. I'll write how I'm feeling, even if it's awkward and uncomfortable. And, you know, for me, like with my dating life, like I, I'm still single, but I have been, I've been through really awful relationships and like, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for what it taught me. It helped me grow into the woman that I am, but I have been through tough stuff. And I definitely had moments where I'm like, you know, questioning once again, everything. And I'm like, I, what if I never find love? And Heartbreak is a hard feeling, right? The painful breakups, they suck. (laughs) But I've noticed once again, there is a power when you sit in that emotion and when you don't try to stuff it down or just push it away, band aid over, bullet hole. You know, you're not like, oh, I'm just going to drink alcohol or numb out or just ignore it and push it down and push it down. That manifests itself super, it'll come out and, you know, as like super toxic, just gross stuff. I want to feel it right away because I feel like also just like I said, the upbringing that I had, my parents always encouraged me to express my feelings. Mm. They always encouraged me, feel your feelings, like say it, journal it, dance it out. So it also that kind of comes naturally to me. Like when I feel something, I'm like, wow, you know, this is really frustrating. I feel so like I I sometimes will say it out loud. I'll just, you know, another helpful tip is scale of one to ten feeling an emotion, you know, label it, give it a name. What am I feeling? I feel jealous. I feel really jealous. I feel angry. I feel, and it's okay to feel it. There is no, you don't need to feel shameful, but it's like saying it out loud and then give it a number one to 10 on the scale. Okay. So right now, you know, I feel really jealous. I feel very angry. I feel triggered. That's another good one. And it's like, okay, one out of 10, I feel like a seven out of 10, you know, that's, that's high. Okay. So to me, anything above a five, I'm going to, you know, maybe take a pause from if I'm doing work or something and go on a walk outside. I'll go do breath work because breathing through emotions kind of helps them, you know, move quicker rather than like, let's say, you know, I just got broken up with and I feel like it's so I'm so angry. Like my most people, their initial reaction and sometimes what we want to do is, you know, just sit in the anger, right? Just stay stagnant and stay stuck. But it's like if you think about it, emotions, you know, to be released, you have to move your body, exercise, breath work. It sounds a little weird, but it's just the truth. Because if you sit there stagnant, you're not allowing the emotion, you know, to move. You're not giving it like breath work really helps deep emotions that are stuck way deep down, like childhood trauma type stuff. It allows them to be brought up to the surface so you can breathe through it. That's why I love breath work and Mm -hmm. like dancing and going on runs because you feel so free. You know what I mean? Like staying stuck and like watching Netflix for 10 hours, you're not really allowing the emotion to like move through you. So I I really, you know, I swear by it. Next time you guys are feeling an emotion, say it, say it out loud, write it on paper, give it a name and then label it one out of 10. You know, right now I feel 10 out of 10 feels really, I'm really heightened. Like I need to go, go on a walk, go do breath work, pause on the work stuff. Cause to me, it's like, I also want to be productive. You know, I don't want to be sending emails and feeling like (laughs) anger. So I'd rather be like, okay, work smarter, not harder. We're not forcing ourselves to do stuff when I'm just in a weird place. So I'll take a pause, 
I'll go, yeah, on a walk. I'll go do an ice bath, something to kind of refresh me. I'll eat a healthy meal, call up someone that makes me feel really good about myself. I have all these tips, but then it really does help. You know, it helps. Even the most difficult emotions that we think are going to last forever, mm -hmm. it does not last forever. Um, I love that. But yeah, it just helps, right? Clean up your room, do something, go, go to a store that you love, go smell candles, you know? I, <laughs> I don't know, but it helps. So um, I think it's all about, mastering your emotions. That's what I'm really big on because some of my life experiences have really taught me firsthand. In the moment, I'm like, I have way more power than I think I do. And I've kind of realized, you know, it may sound weird, but one of my therapists told me, she's like, you know, Megan, life is like a video game or like a movie. You know, there's a bunch of characters, but you are the author, director, you're the person in charge. So if you don't like how it's going, you get to rewrite that script any day that you want. No one else has that power. You know, you're in the driver's seat. And so I've, I've had, like I said, life experiences that have really taught me, you know, um, firsthand, wait, you know, I this person may be, you know, treating me terribly and this person online may be bullying me, but I'm in charge of my emotions. You know, that person, how they treat me, that's their responsibility. Cool. But how I respond is my responsibility. You know what I so mean? So powerful. It's very powerful. And, you know, it's a work in progress. But when you realize it and feel it yourself, it is game changing, you guys. It will change your life. Literally. It's like you feel like because you have mastered life when you realize, you know, um, no one can infiltrate this. This is yours. Only if you give the person the key, like only if you give them the power, but no one else has the power to really affect you if you think about it. And that's something I've really kind of fascinated by because once again, I've had people in my life that, you know, even if you're sitting next to someone that you don't like, it does not have to bother you. It's only in your head. You know, you don't have to allow those, that person's energy or what they say, you don't have to allow it to affect you. And so that's why I'm really big on staying in a high vibrational place by doing breath work and staying in a good mood and doing things that fill up my cup because I just, I find it really, really cool because we create our reality, you know? Wow, man. Yeah. What a story. <laughs> what a journey. And yeah. I just, my, my mind is just still so vividly just seeing how your beautiful life have unfolded in this beautiful way and I I love that you speak about in the earlier year when you do those you know challenging jobs and in your mind you think how does that contribute to the big of pictures course. questioning it and getting frustrated oh yeah and along the way you have such a courage and relentless faith and determination to master yourself your inner words and therefore yeah. and, and manifesting the beautiful outer words that yeah. you are living today and I just truly just um, feel with art and inspiration to who you are becoming this powerhouse thank you Wen you are a powerhouse too it's the feelings mutual um, but no I mean I just feel so grateful for once again looking back in hindsight I'm like Everything really did happen for me, not to me. And everything, even in the moments, right, the wax on, wax off, you're like, what is this teaching me, this heartbreak? I wish it would have worked out with this guy. And oh, my God, I should have. It's like pause, take your power back in, pull it back in and be like, you know what, though? It it really does serve a purpose. And some, for me, some of the most some of the biggest catalysts in my life that led me to the best places started from having my heart broken started from me you know yeah cleaning toilets at yoga studios it, like that to me that drive because once again I was like I never want to feel this way again or I was like I can do this I channeled that inner fire <laughs> it led me to the best most motivated times of my life where I was like in alignment hustling, working hard, like it just gave me a work ethic that is truly priceless. So, yeah. You know, in Chinese, what is word called 打不死的小强, means the, the harder the, the life hit you, you bounce back even harder. And, and it's, that's all a image. it's a choice too. You know, I could have in any of those jobs, I could have literally just been like, I hate this, I'm done and thrown in the towel. And I could have kind of like, not succumb to my circumstances, but I could have easily just been like, oh, I'm cleaning toilets at 20. You know, I'm such a loser. I should have gone to college or I should have done this. But no, I'm all that's why I'm about the mindset. Mastering your mind, you'll master your life is because in those moments, I always use my imagination to actually wait. 
I can make this fun, right? You know, I'm like, I can actually pretend I'm about to meet Oprah. How would I feel? And I always do that. It's a quick manifestation tip. I'd be like, wait, how am I feeling? Oh my God, Oprah's here. And I just tap into those feelings. <laughs> and it, that's how you manifest is tapping into the emotions, the feelings as if it's already happening right now. I actually cannot wait to follow that trip. Literally, you can change your reality. You want your dream partner, your dream house, your dream income, your dream whatever it is. Act as if it's already here. Smell it. Feel it. Really just allow yourself to go to that place. And you would be shocked at how great you can make your reality truly by really using your imagination and like just knowing that you can flip that switch whenever you want. If you're in a meeting where you're bored, once again, you're doing a task and you feel like, oh my gosh, use your imagination. Think about your dream house. For me, it's like, you know, this giant property in Nashville, Tennessee. I want it a little bit outside of Nashville on acres, green rolling hills, beautiful. Like I have the whole, I go on Zillow all the time. I have it Pinterest. And so to me, it's like always staying in that place that's elevated and like, Choosing it, though, once again, because it, it is a choice, um, but it's a gift that we all have. You know, you guys can do it wherever you are at any time. So I, I'm going to go back to the courage, Madigan. I think you have such a beautiful courage to stay true to who you are, what yeah. you want. And despite whatever life situation throw you, whatever things is, and you stay true in yourself, your why. Yeah. Your, your future, your beautiful aspiration to truly make a world a better place. So with that, Megan, I want to truly thank you for thank you know truly you. taking time, being here, yes. and share such authentic stories. And I really believe that that story is going to really impact and empower yeah. so many others. So Yay. thank you. Thank you, Wen, for having me on. This has been so fun. I have loved chatting. I feel like I could sit here for hours and talk to you. You have a wonderful personality, too. And everything that you say is so warm and infectious and just your energy exudes. Um, but yeah, one thing I do want to leave everyone with is to really remember that, you know, your success in life and your happiness, your well-being, all of your goals, it really is up to you to achieve all of it. It's not up to anyone else. And like I, I always will stand by this really firm a believer, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. You know, really anything is possible. And when you have that mindset, you're going to want to push for more and it's only going to make you a better person. It's only going to make you more disciplined, right? When you're like, wait, I can do this ice bath. I can do my laundry. I can go tell that person how I feel and set that boundary. And it's like, why not live your best quality life and really just live authentically you? And it's it's all possible. So I love that. Why not? Why not? It's and all there. Plus, if not now, when? If not you, whom? <laughs> now is the best time. Yes. So choose what life you want to yes. live and having the courage to stay true yes. to that path. Because I think we all here share our beautiful gift. Yes. And it's such a blessing to meet a beautiful, powerful house like you to truly share that story, share that possibility. So again, everything is possible yeah. when you choose to. So thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Also, thank you for each and every one of you for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And I cannot wait to see you all next show. Bye, guys.